All right. How's it going? I'm Sarah and he's James and we're the Hold or Nothing. We are in Arequipa. It's just a few hours from Puno and it's the second stop on our Peruvian adventure. Right now we're in Arequipa's main square, which is where much of the action starts. You might be able to hear in the background actually there's a protest going on as we speak. Every city and town has got a square or a plaza right at the heart of it in South America. And we've probably been to well over 100 by now, but this has got to be one of the most beautiful that we've ever seen. This cathedral is the main focal point of the plaza and it's kind of unique in that while it appears massive, what looks like the front is actually the side, so in reality it's really long and thin and nowhere near as big as it first seems. The stone that it's made from is volcanic rock, which is what most of the architecture in the city is constructed from. Interestingly, the white colour is where the city's nickname comes from, partially anyway. The other reason it's called the White City is because its racial makeup used to be over 70% white and proud of it. In fact, we've been told by someone in the know that it was also one of the most racist cities in Latin America. But though the nickname sticks, that's all changed. These days it's a diverse, modern, open-minded metropolis. We're about to head into Santa Catalina Monastery, which is basically like a mini walled city within Arequipa. Um, back in the day, wealthy families used to give their daughters to the church, along with large donations of money, and they used to stay in there forever. Being accepted into this convent used to be seen as a great honour, and while in some ways it was a life of solitude and piety, as you can see it didn't exactly involve sacrifice and suffering. Girls as young as 12 would start their training and stay secluded in this small section of the monastery for four years. Once that time was up, they would move into the main part of the monastery and into a house that their family had bought or had built, and here's where it gets interesting. The richer the family, the better houses they could afford, and some of them are absolutely massive the largest boasting four bedrooms and two kitchens. But even more amazingly, many of the nuns would have up to four servants running around after them, while some even owned slaves. Probably not the first thing that springs to mind when you picture a nunnery. This did eventually change in the middle of the 19th century, when the Catholic Church came down hard on the convent for its practices, forcing it to abandon its, shall we say, creative interpretation of monastic life. These days it's still a working monastery, but perhaps unsurprisingly, the number of nuns here has dwindled from over 200 in its heyday to around just 20 now. As you can see, the monastery is absolutely beautiful. It's not cheap to get in, it's 40 soles, and on top of that you have to pay for the tour as well, which is an extra 20 soles. However, if you are gonna go in, we'd highly recommend getting the tour because you get a lot more information than what's on the boards, and they do the tours in Spanish, in English, in French, whatever language you wanna speak, and it's absolutely fantastic. Now this might come as a bit of a surprise to you, but Arequipa, and not Lima, is widely regarded as the foodie capital of Peru. And we've spoken to a lot of people about this and they can assure us that basically it's got the best food that we're going to taste in the whole of the country. We are heading to San Camilo Market now, which apparently is one of the best places to sample that food. So we're going to see what's on offer and stuff our gobs. Check this out, this market is absolutely huge and it's separated down into different sections as well. So you've got your ceviche alley, you've got a bit that sells juice, and there's even a little bit that just sells olives. Um, all the portions here are absolutely huge and it's really cheap. Of course, one of the things that you must try when you come to Peru is ceviche. And we've come to a ceviche area in the market. First, what you get is a little fish soup and then the ceviche comes afterwards. That fish broth was absolutely delicious, but now we're on to the main course, what we've been waiting for. And here in Peru, it traditionally comes served with sweet potatoes, some toasted corn, and is garnished with a load of onions and also a bit of seaweed. The broth that you can see in here is actually called leche de tigre, I think, which means tiger's milk. I don't know why it's called that, but it is the main star of the show. It's absolutely delicious. Let's get going. 
Oh man, this is so good. It's got lime, it's spicy, it's obviously fishy, and you've got the texture of contrast there with the crunchy corn and the nice and soft steamed sweet potato. Delicious. who comes to the most famous ice cream maker in the city. She's called Doña Rosa and she makes a type of ice cream that you can find everywhere in Arequipa, which is called queso helado. Now queso means cheese in Spanish, but we can assure you there's no actual cheese in this recipe. Its main ingredients are milk, sugar and cinnamon, and everything is mixed and put into one of these huge vats over a barrel of ice. It's then spun around really fast and the bits that splash up the side immediately freeze and are scraped out onto a plate. Queso helado is absolutely delicious and this is definitely the best we've tried in Arequipa and we're not the only ones who think this. Check out all these newspaper articles written about it. Best of all, a huge plate like this will set you back exactly two solids. There's a traditional type of restaurant here which we've been told is completely unique to Peru and they're mainly found in Arequipa with just a few in Cusco. They're called picanterias and basically they're like old school inns or canteens where you go with your pals to have a good meal and yeah, gossip basically I think. There aren't that many left um, but the one that we're headed to now is called La Capitana and apparently it's the most traditional one that's left in Arequipa and um, the food's meant to be amazing. The idea is that you share a table with anyone that'll have you. Um, yeah, it's just supposed to be really social. Picanterias were described to us as the olden day equivalent of social media, where people from all classes would get together and chew the fat, discuss the latest news, complain about their troubles and write the world's wrongs. And not much has changed about this one. Check out that wood-fired oven. We didn't know what to get, so we've gone for a selection. This is like a salad with pig's face. This is a beef stew. This is uh, noodles and cheese. It's a bit like macaroni. And this is locro, which is some type of meat, um, I think pork, and like a stew that's got corn and potato in it. And this is chicha morada, which is a fermented herb and corn drink. The meal here was really good and we'd highly recommend checking out this restaurant if you're in our keeper. Another delicacy here in Peru that meat eaters should try is something called koi. It's essentially a guinea pig and despite Sarah's face, she knew exactly what she was ordering. I just sent a picture of my lunch to my dad and he's absolutely disgusted. So I just want to point out a couple of things. Koi here, or guinea pigs, um, are farmed. They're not some kind of like weird fetish. It's the same as eating a chicken or a cow or a pig. If you eat meat, it's exactly the same kind of thing. I think one of the things is that Westerners just aren't used to seeing the head of an animal on their plate. Like you, you wouldn't normally have a chicken breast and have the chicken head on the plate, obviously. My dad said something about uh, the dogs in China that they have festivals around. It's nothing like that. These uh, animals that are farmed here, the koi, they aren't tortured and cooked alive. It's exactly the same as any kind of farmed meat. But let us know what you think in the comments. If you came to Peru, or if you've been to Peru, did you try the koi? Would you try it? It's really hot in Arequipa today, so we have stopped for a refreshment at Pisco Sours, of course. I think most people have probably heard of Pisco, but if you haven't, it's like a clear brandy type of drink, and it's delicious. surrounded by three massive volcanoes and although they do go off from time to time big eruptions are rare I think the last one was in the 1400s however tremors are actually relatively frequent here and there was a decent sized earthquake in 2001 that damaged a lot of buildings and knocked down one of the towers on the cathedral in the central square that said they do have alarms inside the volcanoes so if it's about to erupt then hopefully we'll get some prior warning but the most famous and aggressive volcano is called Misty and you can see it from virtually anywhere in the city. But the best place to catch a glimpse of it is right here in this viewpoint called Yanawara. It's really popular for sunset and you can see why.
been in a museum called Santuarios Andinos where there is a frozen Inca mummy. Now normally it's one called Juanita, but she is somewhere else at the moment. I think they're doing some experiments on her is what they said. Um, so it was a different one called Sarita. Um, yeah, you can't take any uh, films or photography or anything in there because of how the stuff's preserved. Basically, obviously the mummy is uh, still frozen like it was on the on the mountain where they where they got them from. But also all the artifacts and stuff that were found with the bodies. I think they found eight or was it ten? There was quite a few anyway that have been found like across the Andes, um, stretching like for, right down from Colombia down to um, Chile, I think. Yeah. Most of them were found in Peru though. Yeah, a lot of them were found in Peru. Yeah, it was super, super interesting. If you come to Arequipa, you should definitely go. The neighbourhood that we're in right now is called San Lazaro and it's the oldest neighbourhood in Arequipa and you'll notice that it's completely different as well from the rest of the city. It's not laid out in grids, the streets are really narrow and windy. Um, it, I think it was modelled on villages in Italy and Spain, right, where the people who came from that lived here. And yeah, it's where you'll find most of the coolest bars in the city. Arequipa has got a cracking nightlife and this district is home to lots of craft beer bars. Particularly on weekends you'll find a lot of live music and lively crowds. And of course, on your way home you've got to stop for the Peruvian equivalent of a kebab, a barbecued chicken heart skewer called an anticucho. The most traditional type of textile in this part of the world is wool, but it doesn't come from sheep here, it comes from these little guys, alpacas. There's a few different varieties but they're all from the same camelid family and are pretty similar. As well as alpacas, there's vicuñas, guanacos and llamas too. Some produce really fine wool, others are better as working animals and were traditionally used to transport goods, while others are farmed to eat. This place is called Alpaca World and it tells the history of the animals in the region as well as the role that they play now. things to do in the evening in Arequipa is to come up onto a rooftop bar. There's plenty of them about and they're really lovely to watch the sunset from. This one in particular has got a view right over the whole of the plaza. The plaza is a hive of activity at this time of evening and a great spot for people watching. Watching the legendary Arequipa sunset turn the skies from orange to gold to purple and bathe in the cathedral in a gorgeous light is the perfect way to round off a hard day's sightseeing. Guys, we hope you enjoyed our wee tour of Arequipa. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment and press that little alarm bell thing so that it tells you next time we post a video. As usual, there's lots more detail on all the things to do in Arequipa down below in the blog post link. And join us next time when we're going trekking in a canyon that is apparently twice as deep as the Grand Canyon in the US. We're hoping to find condors, geysers and even some hot springs as well. See ya. Bye.